All right, everybody, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Operation Redwood. I'm here with my co host, Alfredo and Bryant. Um, today is a free flow conversation, but there are some things we want to hit on. So, Alfredo, how are we going to start this off, man? I know you got some fire under you right now, so we'll go with that. Well, yeah, I mean, let's just get right into it. I'm sh- I mean, I shouldn't be shocked, but I'm just shocked at the degradation of our society. And hmm. At the, at, the, at the thought that people are not protecting their children as hard as I think they should be, you know, coming as a father, uh, as a husband. Um, some of the headlines that I'm reading today, I, I, would, I would lose work. I would march to the schools. Mm-hmm. I would try and get, you know, some like-minded people, Facebook groups, whatever, and just start protesting. Uh, and if anyone hasn't heard by now, there is a school in Oklahoma, of all places. Um, if you don't know, Oklahoma is a fairly conservative state. Um, but apparently that's changing. And I don't know if that's a reflection on the people or if that is just a, a continued reflection of our elected officials that aren't representing us well. And why do I say this? There is a man that was uh, hired as a principal of a school that is a sex offender. And on the weekends, does drag cross dresses. Okay, you're an adult, do as you please, you know, live your life. But in case nobody heard me, again, he's a sex offender, right? And supposedly it's alleged, but I don't know how it's alleged that this individual was caught with child pornography. How do you allege that? I don't don't understand that. Mm. Um, But his name, and I have it right here, is actually Shane Mernon, okay? I don't understand how that happens. Does do the parents of that school know what's going on and and who was hired on as principal? You know, did the superintendent know the background? That's a rhetorical question. I already know the answer. The answer is yes. They already knew, and yet he was still hired on. Where? Why? Hmm. why even if it's a legend. Why take the chance of having a sex offender? It's it's one thing if you're a sex offender and, you know, rape is a terrible thing and any sort of sex offense is a terrible thing, right? Any sort of unwanted advances are terrible. But to have a sex offender that was called with child, child pornography to be the principal of a school, someone in charge of the dynamics of the school, someone that oversees who else gets hired in, who's going right. to educate your children from now on? You know, who is going to be brought on? Who's going to work in the cafeteria? Who is going to be the janitor at this place, cleaning the bathrooms? That's, it's just wrong. It's backwards, you know? And there's going to be absolutely no uh, understanding on my behalf for a sex offender to be anywhere near children. We have these laws for a reason. You know, sex offenders cannot be within certain feet of even playgrounds. You know, it just, it baffles me where we are going. Who is Who are making these decisions? And us as the people, why are we allowing it? It just, mm. it, it drives me to, to, to be ever more fervescent in my in my goal to to know who is educating my children what is this school about what are they teaching here i want to be present i want to get to know all the teachers i want to get to know the principal i want to i want background checks on everybody all right i'm about to go full cia when it comes to schools (laughs) you're gonna pat everybody down that comes to the school i'm i sure am (laughs) it it just it's insanity it's ludicrous i mean 10 years ago this this would not even be a question. Ten years ago, nobody would even dare to have a sex offender as a, a teacher or work in, as a anywhere near our education system. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's it, it's 
it's idiotic. You're you're setting up a, a chess game. They're setting up they're setting up a, a a chess game, and they're putting pieces strategically. And whether or not you believe it's some part of a grand scheme or not, it really seems that way if you're paying any attention. And if you can think critically a little bit, you know, I'm sounding a little demeaning right now, but if you if you have the ability to question things, even a little bit, and say, you know, let me look into this on my own. Let me not just accept things for what they are. Let me do my own research. Mm -hmm. Let me see if this is, you know, if someone's telling me this is for your good, let, let me see if it is for my own good. Is it for my benefit? Is it for the benefit of my family, for my friends, for my community? Is it good for my soul? I mean, uh, I am not happy about this because you know how it is. It starts in one place and then it spreads. And out of mm. Oklahoma, of all places, I would think everybody would have just marched up to the school and had words to say less. Does this say what uh, level of education this gentleman is the principal of? I want to say it's an elementary school. Let's uh, let's let's look it up real quick. Um, elementary. That's tough. Yeah, because yeah. essentially you're putting, you know, an individual that could really threaten these kids with adverse action, and the kid not knowing how to go about communicating or being mm -hmm. fearful to communicate um, in yes. that situation. That that is tough. Yes. It really is. It, it's almost like they're trying to decriminalize, you know, certain types of crimes and whatnot, while others, you know, are still held as being like the worst thing um, in comparison with murder. Even even murders, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. And I, I've said this before. They are normalizing a lot of weird things. I've said it before with Satan, but they're they're starting to normalize pedophilia. What do they call it now? Minor attracted person. What is that? You know, people are just changing the language. That's all they're doing. It's like Satan in the Eden, right? It's just changing language. The devil is back up to his old tricks. And it sounds silly, but it's true. It's the same game. It hasn't changed at all. But just nobody is doing their own research anymore. Nobody wants to. Everyone just hears something. They read a headline and they regurgitate. They don't, they don't look anything else up for themselves. Yeah. And so, you know, lust is 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 being changed. You know, um, fornication is being changed. Uh, 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 abortion, the, the names, all these names, they're all being changed to something yeah. else. But they're all they're all they all have ancient names. They all have names that have been the same for thousands of years. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's see, and I, I guess the only thing that I could relate this to biblically is um, when Saul was going through his, you know, periods where he was loving David and then like shortly after finding out that David was, you know, extremely successful in battle and whatnot, essentially envying him and then wanting to kill him. You mm -hmm. know, it, it yep. says in the Bible that Saul was tormented with a troubling spirit and then the people surrounding him were offering him, um, you know, the playing of a harp, which yeah. I believe that David was doing. Um, mm -hmm. And he was also the armor bearer for Saul. You know, so in all those things, um, Saul was essentially perverting what it was that David was doing for him to help further his kingdom into being something that was essentially taken away from it. Um, mm -hmm. it. It's weird how nowadays we call the things that used to be evil good and vice versa mm. and to add on to what you were saying right before you you said good and evil and evil is bad which is prophetic you know we we know that in from, from the book of revelations uh a lot of people don't know about being thankful right like you were saying david was helping saul he was doing him a service he was aiding him and, and building up god's kingdom for Saul, making Saul look good, yeah? So instead of being thankful and giving God glory, he gets jealous and he gets angry. And now he wants to send David away. He wants to kill David. So it 
sometimes we don't know a good thing when it's it's right in our face. Yeah. I think that kind of goes into one of the topics that I know that we were going to be addressing with the modern man, uh, father and husband, where essentially it, it feels as though um, a, a real man is absent now, you know, um, mm-hmm. in a lot of households, I should say, because I know that I'm president of mine, um, mm-hmm. where essentially it, it talks about how a man, you know, I don't want to say chastises, but, you know, they they essentially probe issues. Uh, to make sure that essentially all the bases are covered for all the things that they have to worry about. And if you really recognize in the Bible how men that were utilized were really like flock leaders, um, shepherds, if you will, uh, but they were controlling the flocks. And those were the individuals that were utilized in the Bible to go about somewhat shaping the story. These individuals that were, I guess, back then they might have been seen in a higher regard than what they are now. Um, but you compare that same um, individual to the person now, um, that would be, you know, a farmer. You don't necessarily look at a farmer as being, you know, the worst person. Um, side like with the sanitation specialist, nothing against them, um, you know. But they don't carry the same weight as the the CEO of that billion dollar, multi billion dollar company. Mm-hmm. Um, and back then, you know, it's one of those things that um, I don't know. It's um, it's one of those things that it's it's worrisome because the individuals that we have now, they, they don't necessarily know how to lead. And it's not necessarily as a result of something that they did. Um, it's something that they didn't have the opportunity to observe. You know, but how do we go about addressing the issue of, you know, manhood in yeah. America where it's it's kind of taboo now to be, you know, that that masculine individual? You know what I mean? Where it, yeah. it's it's frowned upon to, you know, show any signs of testosterone where, you know, they, they want men to go about being more feminine and they want women to go about, you know, leading in everything. Not saying that's a bad thing. Um, but when you displace the man from the positions that they were generally holding, uh, what does that do for the children and the future generations? Yeah. And I love that connection and you, you did it so masterfully because what, we started off talking about this principle and this and this sex offender is I 100% believe is an identity crisis linked to the lack of manhood, the lack of masculinity, because let's just be real. If there was someone in that school who had the backbone to be like, yo, this dude's a sex offender. My kid goes to this school. Excuse my French, but F no (laughs) you know yes but we don't it didn't happen this 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 person was still able to get into this seat of power of leadership in this school because there's no man that stood up and said no that is wrong alleged or not comes as a result as the of the uh the cancel cart the cancel uh thing What are they calling it? Cancel cancel culture? culture. Yeah, I'm sorry. The the cancel culture is like scaring people out of being able to do the things that you shouldn't be scared to do. You know, calling out the individuals that are doing wrong. As Mm. a result, you know, people are being called, you know, um, transphobic, homophobic, you know, whatever these things might be. When in reality, you might not have a phobia of, but (laughs) you're, you're trying to call things, you know, out for what they are. And people yeah. don't like the fact that people are doing that anymore. Isn't that jacked up? It's like you're transphobic. Like I'm not afraid of them. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> like like let's just let's just like phobic phobia is fear. Yeah, I am not afraid of them. Yeah, <laughs> like it goes back like, to the rewording of words, the the, the new different definitions of words, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that, that totally roots back into the definition of what a man is. Hence, why we put together this organization, this podcast, this movement. Because each of us are in different stages of our lives. Yet we have such a common thing of we're just, we're men trying to figure it out. And we're living in a world that is not trying to figure it out. We're living in a world that is going opposite of where it should be going. And I think all three of us and like the more people that we have on the show, like in, 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 for, in future interviews, 
are getting so sick and tired of the direction where that it's going because we know that this battle is going to be beyond our lifetime. This is going to be the battle that our kids are going to deal with. Yep. And if we don't set up, if we don't set them up now, gain some ground, gain some momentum, gain for them, they're in trouble. Extremely. I couldn't agree more. And to, to, you know, kind of not answer the question because there's no, there's no uh, straight answer, no simple answer for, for Brian's, you know, question. Hmm. You know, how do we address, how do, how do we address the issue of quote unquote manliness, right? Or, or being in your masculine when you're fighting the currents, the waves of a population that doesn't appreciate that anymore that doesn't see the benefits of it right uh well you gotta strap on your boots you gotta get ready to piss off some people because unfortunately at least in the u.s it's part of the culture now this is spread already this, we, we have a an epidemic of of vile of bad of evil we have an epidemic of confusion and to, to combat that, the only thing you can do is become your own your own role model, your own superhero, right? Like we are Christians, we have a role model, Jesus Christ, right? Gave for that. But for our secular friends, you have to become that person that you want that you that you want to be. You have to become your own role model. You have to become a superhero. You can't lead anyone if you don't know how to lead yourself first, right? You want, mm -hmm. you know, to inspire people. You have to inspire yourself. You know, you want to bring out the best in people. You have to bring out the best in yourself, right? Be all you can be, right? Like the army. And so you have to just push forward. You have to find a goal, find purpose in your life. Find a reason to get yourself out of bed in the morning and say, I'm doing this not just for yourself, but you're going to do it for your kids. You're not doing it just for yourself, but because one day you're going to lead like-minded individuals. You're not doing it just for yourself because you're going to do it because one day you are the revolution. The revolution starts with you. Mm. So you have to find out what the truth is. You have to find the truth and then you have to follow the truth. And then you have to be fearless in speaking the truth. And I am guilty of not speaking the truth in the past, but there are lines now that I have in my life that I'll speak truth all day and night. And I don't care if I have to make enemies of friends or family. I don't want to. I would rather have a, a great conversation of, of opposing views, right? Because that's really what we need is honest conversation of opposing views. Mm -hmm. That we can speak truths, you know, whatever your truth is, whatever my truth is. And see what we learn, right? In honesty, and without the ego. Right. Because it's important to be proud of yourself. It's important to want to accomplish things, but you have to keep your foresight on the bigger picture. For me, that's the afterlife. For me, that's bringing up my family and friends. I don't know what it is for you listening. But you have to you have to bring yourself to that point where you're open to discussion, and open to having a conversation where you might be wrong. And you could learn something or you might be right and you might bring someone out of darkness. You might save someone from themselves or from someone else. Mm. See, and I guess with the times that we're living in right now, it's kind of tough, you know, because they're removing the truth from, you know, the libraries, the schools, really in yes. general. I mm -hmm. mean, you think about how far we are removed from when I was in elementary school, middle school, we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. To You know, I don't, I don't know why, but they were talking about taking, you know, the under God, out of the Pledge of Allegiance, and they don't even say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. You know what I mean? Like, what, what's the reason? There, there's not really a reason. Uh, if you don't say it, then what's what's the issue with having that in there? Um, but I guess people just have an issue with having, you know, the the secular clash with, you know, the religious. Um, so it's, it's kind of worrisome because, as you already stated, in the future, people are going to end up having to seek out that truth. But where are they really going to be able to find it if everything that mm. you know we use in modern day is going to be stripped from them? 
the only truth that they're going to end up knowing or um, otherwise it's going to be the things that we pass down to them. And I'm not sure if anybody is dealing with it right now, but I know I am, you know, with my teenager, you know, she, she wants to be combative with everything. And, you know, where I'm trying to speak truth, she's not necessarily able to see it that way because her friends views and then, you know, just everybody that she encounters on a regular basis, what it is that society is pushing to her as being, you know, um, inclusive, Mm. not saying that you have to, you know, exclude people from your activities and, you know, otherwise, but um, being able to know the difference between right and wrong is becoming so skewed uh, where everything that we're doing now could be questionable, you know? So where exactly can people go for that truth in the near future when everything that we have now might disappear or just being rewritten, you know? Yeah. Mm. Angelo, I think you said this day before that we could be the only Bible that anyone's ever heard or read. Yeah. You know, and mm. you're, you're right, Brian. I mean, look, I, 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 I read some headlines. I didn't even look into it, but, um, Apparently, they're trying to make ChatGPT rewrite the Bible, you know. And uh, I don't know what that's about, but it could be. It, 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 I'm sure it is going along with what you're saying. You know, all these truths are being rewritten, vocabulary definitions are being changed. Why? Because eventually, the next generation is going to come by, and there'll be a new set of books. There'll be a new curriculum, and. Now, it's not that important that you do 60 sit-ups and, you know, 30 push-ups and you can do X amount of dips when I know that was the case when I was in school. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't really have that. Now we have an obesity problem. You know, there people are always, you know, preaching health that comes from a pointy object that, you know, and a syringe, right? But if you talk about being healthy by doing something that gets your heart rate up, it gets you sweaty every day, you know, push something, pull something, run. That's not health. No. Keep eating McDonald's though. That's really healthy. Mm. Don't get me wrong though. I I mean, I, I like McDonald's, but <laughs> I don't eat it anymore. Let's <laughs> see. Yeah. And, but I, mean, I guess all that kind of feeds yeah. into that, the mental health epidemic that we're experiencing as well. You know what yes. I mean? Because with all these things being removed, not having the education of, you know, how to go about being healthy um, and so on, just really just getting your information from YouTube uh, mm -hmm. or, you know, individuals that claim to be experts, but, you know, they, they read maybe less than what you did and they're just regurgitating something that they heard from somebody else. You know, Social you, media. I know. Exactly. If you ever go on to YouTube and you ever look up anything fitness, you'll see this guy that pops up and he says, you know, um, these certain foods are killing your testosterone. You might watch that whole video, you know, five minutes, and he never mentions anything about which foods to avoid. You know what I mean? But if, if you subscribe right here, I'm going to give you all the details that you need. <laughs> like, dude, I just wasted all this time. And all you said was, you know, there was something that I'm supposed to be avoiding, but I'm not. Tell me what I need to know. So we're wasting so much time in those kind of things. And then you just get to the point where it's like, why am I even bothering? Mm. I'm looking for this information and I can't find it. Where do I go? And then the sources that you're rolling to, they, they're not giving you anything of substance. You know, so the people that actually have anything, you know, to them, they're saying, you know, th this is pointless. Uh, I'm not able to find the information that I'm looking for, even though I'm overloaded with information on a daily basis. 100%. I think that that's exactly the case. It's like, you know, let's say pre let's, let's date back pre-internet, right? You had to go to the library. You had to do your own research. You had to do your due diligence, read, study, do all of these different things. And then when the internet came out, you have a flood of information at your fingertips. You can have it at like the drop of a dime. You can learn anything and everything that you want. So it's not like, it's not even, a, it's not a lack of resources. It's a lack of being resourceful, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Find the right information, find the truth. But sometimes it's even harder to find the truth if you dilute it with a lot of things <laughs> that, that look similar. Like, and I, I think, I think, I mean, I know we're kind of, I, I love where this conversation is going because if you just look at if you take a step back and look at where the world is going, 
God had this initial plan for us to live with him in the Garden of Eden, right? And then we started exploring alternatives. And then from there, it just spiraled out. We could have had it. We could have been there. But because we we settled for something subpar, something we thought might be better, but it really wasn't. That momentum just kept on going and going and going. And I'm going to share this with you guys. I know you guys got some nuggets with you, but I want to I want to put this out there. This was so profound. And I, I, I truly believe that God speaks to us, not in the loud, like storms and thunder and Angelo, listen to me. Right. Like, I don't believe this guy. I don't I, for me, at least God doesn't speak to me like that. God speaks to me when things are quiet. When things are calm. When he has my attention. When I'm not thinking of this and doing that, when I'm being present. And yesterday, it was a really, really cool opportunity because you guys know my leg is busted, so I can't do my normal routine and workout and stuff. So I'm spending a whole lot more time with Lana, my two-year-old. And I have this app on my uh, iPad. And I usually take my notes on my iPad. But yesterday, she just really wanted to play. So I'm like, okay, baby, I got to finish some work. And then, you know, we'll play. She just kept bugging me. So I pull up this app and it's basically the Bible, but for kids. And it's really cool. It's interactive. You know, there's a lot of things that it's like in the beginning, blah, blah, blah. And there's a lot of interactive cartoons and she's able to press it. And it's, it's, it's a really cool thing. I'm like, okay, cool. I've read this. I know what this is. We get to the part where um, in Genesis, the beginning of time where where God created um, heaven or sorry, what do you get when he created the earth and man and woman? And there was a part that uh, uh, there's a part where it was reading the story back to us where I never heard this. I was like, what? I, I, I was like, wait, 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 hold on. I have to rewind. She's all pressing buttons. I'm like, baby, stop. Baby, stop. <laughs> like, Papa has to learn something really quick. I did not hear that part. And, and I have it pulled up right here. And in this app, it was talking about Genesis 3.15. And I'm going to read this to you guys really quick. And in context, this is like right after um, the serpent tricks Eve. Uh, Eve bites the apple, then gives it to Adam. Adam bites the apple. And now God's like, hey, what's going on here? And then and then God finds them. And um, basically, this is now at this point in Genesis 3.15, God is speaking to Adam and Eve and the serpent as well. This is Genesis 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I think this is why there's such an attack on men. Because in the Bible, God says that Eve's son, he will crush your head. I think that's where this whole attack on men, I think this is why the devil's attacking the the identity of men so much because his fall will come from man. And I'm a newbie at this stuff. So you guys tell me what you guys think. Um, You are not wrong, right? And I say not wrong uh, because the defeat of the devil did come through a man. Yes. And that man, as we know, is Jesus. Jesus mm-hmm. Christ was the one that trampled the snake's head, the one that that defeated him at the cross, the one who stepped on his head by re, 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 uh, resurrecting on the third day. He beat death. He took the keys. Um, and now he is making space for us in the many homes of the world. So you're right. Damn. You just pieced that together. I, I, I didn't even think about that. I'm like, Mm. you're right though man so i had a question for you all in regards to that verse not that verse specifically but you know that part of the story where god doesn't really appear until after adam takes the bite yes right why why do you think that is because if god told Mm. adam not to take a bite of the fruit God knew all things even prior to it even occurring, right? But if he knew that Eve was going to be tempted by the serpent, 
why did Eve take the bite and God not appear until Adam was offered the fruit and then he went against God's word? Was it intended for Eve to go about gaining that knowledge to essentially be, you know, that that piece of the man that he was lacking? Because it, if we're being honest, you know, they say that women tend to live a lot longer than men. And I don't know if it's so much the case anymore, but it's because men do stupid stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no. And, <laughs> and we, we've always been in this battle to, you know, show who's more masculine and such. And women just stand back and just watch us do it. And then, you know, we fall off a cliff and then, you know, die on a jagged rock. <laughs> you know, but why? I don't do anything stupid. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> why is it that God did not appear to Eve? Was it be only because he didn't tell her specifically not to take the bite or not to eat of the fruit? Mm. And I know that would be speculation, of course, but I wanted to get Charles' perspective. That's so. So uh, I have my own. I thought about this myself, and I believe it's because God gave God put man as the steward of Earth, right? Mm-hmm. When God created Adam, he said, he put him in charge. He said, all right, get to work. Name all the animals. Take care of them. This is, this is you. This is, this is the job that this is the work that I have for you. Mm. Um, he will hold us accountable over our families as fathers, as husbands. He will look at us as the, the head of the household. You know, um, the the Bible tells you know wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives, right? As Christ uh, loved this is church. You know, do everything for your wife. You know, Christ died for his church. Mm-hmm. God, Jesus laid down his life. He made the ultimate sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have our roles to play, right? Um. But God will ultimately see us as his appointed leaders. Why do you think that, you know, children respond to male figures better? I know that when my kids are having a hard time eating, all my, all, the only thing my wife has to do is call my name out. And they start, ah, ha, ha, ha. you know, they just start <laughs> eating, you know. I'm done, Papa. <laughs> yeah. And she's like, why? Why why do they why do they react like this? Why is it that at the thought of you, they just they stand up straight and they get their act together, you know? Because God gave us authority, because God gave us uh, a role to play. And that is to be a steward of the blessings that He gave us, you know, mm-hmm. to lead, lead by example, lead in kindness, lead with love, say the truth. And so mm. out of the gifts that he gave us, he will expect dividends. He will expect us to grow that. Mm. I like that, man. And yeah. you can kind of see that in pretty much every story in the Bible where, you know, it always goes through like that ebb and flow of, you know, uh, this person was, you know, after God's heart and then they mess up. Mm. God withdrew from them, you know, and then they they start seeking God again. Then God comes back close to them. And then, you know, they do something, mess up, God withdraws from them. It's like, why do we keep doing this? You know, we've been doing this since the beginning of time. You know, it's it's just a natural thing for human beings now. And was it ever meant for us to, you know, get out of that ebb and flow? Or is this just the way that human time was made to be? Mm. You know, because we, we weren't ever supposed to be perfect, per se, you know. Uh, God was filling that gap and is filling that gap. So yes. if it wasn't meant for, you know, man to go about eating, but woman was, and she essentially became like the caregiver for the man that, Hey, don't, don't eat that, you know, piece of whatever that's poison. You know, yeah. she that it was poisonous, but the man didn't. And then he just killed over and died. You know, <laughs> what happens then? You know what I mean? Of course, this is all just speculation, you know, storytelling, I guess. Um, but had she not taken that bite, where would we be as a society right now living 
in the Garden of Eden? Could it have potentially been somebody else that would have messed up our blessing? You know, all these generations fold out and then, you know, um, Adam didn't per se take the the bite uh, out of the um, fruit, but Alfredo does. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. I'm living in my house next door and then God is like, hey, you know, that's thousands of years taken off of your life because Alfredo did this. <laughs> my bad, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, I always have know? to blame on that one. My bad. <laughs> yeah, it, it was good if you asked. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Was it really like an apple, or was it more like a peach? Was it more like yeah. a peach? Just tell me. Exactly. Just tell me. <laughs> I'll never tell. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so I've I've always been curious about that, but I only bring that up because, man, if you think about it, a woman having that kind of intuition post eating the fruit would give her the ability to act as, you know, that that natural caregiver, but mm-hmm. the kind that she already is, essentially, right? Because, um, I mean, you think about it, I, I know I act like a little kid whenever I get sick. Like, oh. <laughs> 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 you know, my wife is always, like, right there, and she knows, like, all right, don't eat this, you know, eat this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. You know, if if we didn't have that, what would we be? We, we would be probably some of the laziest people on earth, you know? Um, <laughs> so having the spouse is essentially like having the church or the individuals that are godless, right? Or the people that need healing, maybe mentally, physically, or emotionally. Um, the church acts as that hospital for the people that truly need, you know, a healing. And the church isn't necessarily just that physical building, but it's the the person that we walk in society as. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we are the doctors. Yeah, we we are the doctors for everybody that ends up essentially needing the assistance um, by truly living the life that we were called to live in society. Amen. Amen. Yes, and Alfredo said it earlier. You know, like I, I forgot who said it. Who said it to me? It, it was a pastor, but. Uh, it was like, you may be the only Bible somebody reads. Yeah. And you know what I mean? It's like, and, and, and people will look at you, not on what you say, but what you do. Just like mm. our kids. You know, I could tell Lana all day, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. But she sees me doing it. She's going to do it because he's not yeah. listening to what I'm saying. She's watching <laughs> what I do. Yeah. You know, and, and, and as men, that's how we have to lead our families. Like, don't do as I say, do as I do. Mm-hmm. And we have to lead by example as men, as leaders, as, as you know, whether you're a farmer or you're a big time CEO, you have to lead by example. Mm. And I, I guess that might be one of the reasons why we're approaching such a secular world. You know what I mean? Because um, they look at the example that the church is setting, not all people in the church, of course, but, mm-hmm. you know, um a majority of the people now can't even say majority but a good portion we'll say that um where they're not necessarily living the way that people think that a christ follower is supposed to live but i think that people have that idea screwed up because like we already said individuals are not supposed to be perfect you know Mm -hmm. there are things that the the bible and uh you know really just everything since the beginning of time is called taboo that you know individuals aren't supposed to do um but people think that christians are supposed to be living this this life that is like unobtainable for essentially everybody you know i'm Mm -hmm. supposed to be perfect in all my ways and it's impossible you know it it tells us that we're going to mess up somewhere along the line but Mm -hmm. it's because of the the love that god has jesus has you know for the individuals that we are that we're able to recover that we're able to see the kingdom of heaven because if we were to try to do anything of our own marriage, we would never make it. Amen to that. And we see, we see examples of, of how you said church being a hospital, you know, all over the Bible, you know, the the word says, I believe in first Peter, you know, that by his wounds, we were healed, Mm -hmm. you know, with him, he took, our sicknesses with him he took our sins on the cross so that when we accept him as lord and savior 
the old man dies and we can die. We may die with our sins. And when we are reborn, we are reborn with Jesus. Mm. And like you said, you know, we have these, these champions of the Bible, right? Adam bit the apple, right? Noah, he grew a vineyard, got drunk, some weird stuff happened with the sun. He won't go there right now. And then, <laughs> you know, David, what did he, what happened with David? You know, he, he was he was he he was king for 40 years right he loved god with all his heart a man called by god a man after his own heart and what happened he committed murder and adultery right mm. uh samson you know he gave in to his temptations and god was like hey that's enough right um all these all these individuals don't get me wrong were were saved and were, were with god but they all just go to show us that no one could do it Mm. And the gospel tells us that we could we couldn't have saved ourselves. That's why God had to become flesh. He had to become the incarnate version of himself, sending his one and only beloved son so that he himself had to pay the ticket, the price, the pain, the horror, the gore that we were deserved to pay because we couldn't say it, it, we, we, we couldn't. We, it's, it's impossible because our our best will, our best um, uh, put forward, our our best uh, accomplishments, our rags of filth in mm. front of an almighty, holy God. Mm. But He loves Amen. us so much that He sent the example, and just like you said, we're incapable. This corruptible body, until He comes to, for His church, this corruptible body will just continue doing that being corrupted mm. we're not perfect and we can't so man. uh you hit it you hit mm. it right on the on the nail mm. man I, so Church i want to kind of loop i kind of want to loop everything that we've discussed up until now like together because yes. uh, i love this verse um it's about esther you know esther i forget mm. what where she had actually came from i think that she might have been jewish but i, I could be wrong Right. But she was essentially supposed to be one of the uh, king's servants. And I want to say that this might have been the time where um, the Persians essentially were you know, intermixing and such um, with the Jewish and well, the Israelites and the Egyptians and all that other craziness. Right. So um, one of the, the king's uh, followers were saying, hey, we need to go about eradicating the, the Jews, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, I forget who it was off the top of my head um, that was acting as her mentor because he took her in and was essentially teaching her about the Bible and such. Um, right. But he goes uh, up to her because um, she was serving alongside all these other females and they were all competing to see who was going to be queen. Um, so she got dressed up, you know, made pretty for, you know, the king and the king, you know, made the audience to you know disappear and it was just him and her um so she had favor with the king she left and then you know of course the word got out that you know the king was supposed to be killing essentially all the jews um her mentor comes up to her and he tells her you know if you keep quiet at a time like this deliverance mm -hmm. and relief for the jews will arise from some other place but you and your relatives will die who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this so essentially a foreshadowing for her, you know, telling her that, hey, if you don't go about acting right now, um, the purpose will be carried out. But everything that you could have been solidified in will pass away and somebody else will essentially get your blessing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And that, that has always been so powerful for me because, you know, um, you just think about what is going on right now. And for the, the people that do remain silent, what ends up happening to them? Their family ends up passing away because the things that they're accepting or their family or the families are going to be accepting as truth. They end up, you know, essentially um, poisoning that water that would be able to carry on your future lives. Because if you know the truth and you avoid, you know, the poison. So if we don't end up expressing, how will that truth come about? And I guess it says here, you know, it will come about. And where you could have, you know, had some kind of portion in that, everything that you worked for, you know, everything that you've established for yourself, essentially, or that God had gave you, is going to pass away and something else will rise up. 
something you know 10 times better more than likely mm. oh man yeah. I, I think you tied that in beautifully because from where we started in this conversation and the we're in a world of turmoil and confusion and lack of identity into what does it say in the bible we should do what are we supposed to do in times that god is calling us to step up and care for the mm. things that God cares for. Man, that that was a word for me, Brian. And I appreciate you sharing that because this, this podcast alone, man, we all, let's just be real, we all took a risk being here and speaking on these topics today. This is not like, you know, the Joe Rogan podcast, you can say whatever you want. It's all good. Like, <laughs> like this, the, the topics we're talking about is like real stuff. Like, arguably, you probably won't hear a church sermon on this kind of stuff. This is the, this, this, this stuff doesn't sound good in church. There's limitations within the four walls. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying it how it is. Legit. Yeah. But this platform gives us an opportunity to talk about topics that men, one, men need to hear, and two, problems need to be solved, hmm. right? Yes. Like, if you're going to complain about a problem and not do anything about it, you're just part of the problem. You're just adding fuel to the fire. Hmm. Us three, we got sick of it, and we're like, let, what can we do? What resources can we have? Do we have what? What can we do? And, and like, essentially, like what Esther's doing. What is God calling us to do right now? And in God's perfect, beautiful timing, we all came together for one reason or another, serving on the same team, and now we're pursuing this. Yes. For all men listening out there, and even if you're not a man, even if you're a woman, I mean, be a lantern in the darkness. Shed light. Shed light wherever you go. Wherever you leave, leave things better from when from when you found them. You know what I mean? Uh, you there if this you get one thing out of this conversation, if this is a call to arms. This is it's time to stand up. It's time to buckle your boots up. Stand up for whatever you feel you, you need to believe in, for whatever you really feel is right, whatever God is pushing you in that direction, lean into it. Be courageous. Fear not, for God is with you. The time to speak is now. Amen. Mm. Something that you, you said earlier, uh, both of you had actually mentioned it. And I'm curious to, to because it's it's been mentioned throughout this conversation multiple times, and I'm seeing the pattern, and a lot of it keeps coming back to David. This is like, this is not the, this, it, I'm sorry, this is the David and Goliath. All the kids' stories are about like this little kid slaying this giant with a slingshot and you know oh he's king he's cool blah 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 but there's so much more after that story <laughs> like yeah. that's just a little piece of what most people think of when they think of david david and goliath but and it's not was, even the beginning that right right <laughs> i'm like there, whoa this man had so much more and you know you both said it and david was a man after god's own heart even after, and you know, God had to know David would mess up multiple times, commit all these egregious things. But I'm curious, why is it why why David? What why, why do you guys think David became the kind of blueprint of kind of like the ideal man outside of Jesus, right? Mm. I mean, we could we could really dive into that one. We could make a whole series out of that. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> we could make a whole series. Uh, y'all are funny, man. So okay, we I, I I gave you guys a little bit of a little taste of uh, a series that we are going to be doing. So you guys, the, you guys, like I know you guys are asking right now, guys, please do a series on this. I know what you guys are thinking, um, and we are. We actually are going to dive deeper into David and why um, David is a man after God's own heart. Probably going to go over some stuff in the Bible that you guys have never heard. I actually had to read this stuff myself because when I was told it, I was like, wait, 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 David, the guy that killed the giant, he did what? (laughs) (laughs) You know, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. He did what again? Like, seriously, like, I'm like, wow, there's so many things in in that, um, so much thing, so many, so much knowledge and backstory to David. People think he's just a warrior. He was just a king. Like, dude was singing. He was playing instruments. He was writing poetry. This dude was, what do they call it now? A renaissance man? Like, he was the original renaissance man. This dude was a (laughs) lover, a warrior, a king, and a friend. And all these different facets that we believe here in Operation Redwood, we are going to dive into David. So, yes, we are going to do a future series on David. But before we do that, here's a little bit of a preview. And and these guys didn't know, like, I'm going to put them on the spot like this. But why, like I said earlier, why is David outside of Jesus kind of like the next in line for who we shape and aim to be as a man? Man. Oh, oh, Brian's over there, like, caressing his beard. Like, oh, Oh, man. man. No, because that is a phenomenal question, man. It really is. Give me, give me, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you guys a little, you know, I'm gonna give you guys a second or two. Give me your best 60 to 120 second answer. This is pressure right here. So it's gonna really make you, make you think and pick and choose your words carefully. Because I love these like kind of pressure questions because you got to think and you got to like do it off the spot and condense it really short. So you really, okay, okay. Do, 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 do. What are the main things? What is, what is it in your heart that makes you think and believe why we should be, why, first of all, why we're going to be studying David, right? Why is he the, why is he the blueprint? Man. Okay. So for me, uh, I would say because David started off semi poor, right? Mm. He grew up in a family with multiple siblings that were older than him, and then was pulled from that family, working for Saul. Um, so he lived in, you know, um, the castle, whatever it is that they lived in back then, um, and essentially had to work his way up to having any kind of status. Mm. Uh, so he did that of his own merits. Right. And then he transitions from being, you know, just a servant for him, holding his armor and then goes to fight for him and then eventually takes over the kingdom. You know, one of the largest kingdoms in the world at that time. And then he goes through all these things and then you see the fall and then the rise of David all over again. So Mm -hmm. it just shows just the intricacies of being an individual in the world and nothing is excluded. It, it touches on everything. So I, I love the story of David. Mm, okay. Okay. I think I was like, that was right under two minutes. I'm pretty sure I'm looking at, it, I'm like, okay. Okay. <laughs> Brian. Okay. I like it. I like it. I like it. So uh, for me, like you said, I have to ask myself, like who is David? Right. Mm. And for me, David was a man that feared God, a man that understood that he was a steward, that he had to be resourceful with the resources that God gave him. And he he had skills that he took from the field and applied them to the battlefield. And he applied them to the kingdom. Mm. Man. Ooh, oh man, that's a good this phenomenal man. Dude, that 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 was a great answer as well. That was, I mean, I'm 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 not gonna lie, that was hard to follow up with with Brian's 
really good answer. But I'm I'm here. I'm over here taking notes because you said he was resourceful. He took his skills and he applied it into the battlefield, and at the same time, he also applied it into his kingdom. Yeah, and he was he was mm. God fearing to the point where even when the anointed one Saul came after his life, he refused to kill him out of yes. fear for God. He yeah. said, "He said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hurt the one that God anointed. Who am I? Mm. I am, I am just a flea. That's what he would refer to himself as before the presence of the Lord. I'm just a flea. Who am I to try and harm God's anointed one? Yeah. That amount of humility with God, and the amount of ferocity that he had in the battle, and the amount of love that he had for his sheep when he was tending them, and he would save them from a bear." Or lion with his bare hands. What Goliath? Exactly. Oh man, David is a phenomenal dude. I, I'm really looking forward to looking at him. I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> I am more now. Yeah, I really am. That's so good. That is so good. For everyone listening, they're probably like, okay, there's more to this guy and Goliath. <laughs> and trust me this is going to be a series where it's probably going to be it, it is i already know it's gonna be multiple episode series so we're just gonna have to figure out like we'll do it by where, chapter story yeah how we're gonna <laughs> break this down and how we're going to um slowly give it to you guys so that you got you guys can learn and listen and follow along as we dive into david and you guys can be there listening as well so, I love, I love, love, love this conversation as a whole. Because we, we started on topics that were real, current, very, very relevant. And yet, by the grace of God, we were able to tie it all in into something beautiful. Where we started with, like, kind of dark and edgy, it's real, and to end with hope. Yes, because at the end of the day, as dark as the as the world may get, God calls us to be the light, to bring hope. Mm. Amen. So I am so appreciative of you guys, my 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 co hosts, my brothers, my 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 guys. I appreciate you guys. Um, I can't wait to dive into David. I can't wait where to see where God takes this platform and how he uses this to build his kingdom. Absolutely. And the more, uh, the more guests that we have, the more we can expand, the more we can, you know, dialogue with, uh, people that have different backgrounds, you know, we can dialogue with people from the more secular and people that, you know, have experience dealing with, uh, you know, traumas or, mm. just, you know, people that are, you know, warriors out there, they're ex-military, ex-police officers or martial artists. And uh, after speaking with so many of them, it's it's truly amazing how the knowledge that they have is so translatable. And it's so applicable mm -hmm. to what we're doing here. Yeah. Y'all about to see or hear, however you guys are taking in the content. Or you, both. You, or both, whatever. Um, you guys are about to see and hear and, and, and just see how God uses people in different facets in life. Some in the business world, some in the more secular, some in ministry, some in ministry but they don't say they're in ministry and i think those are like the most fascinating things like god can really use and he does use everybody baggage yeah. and all failures yeah. and all yeah that's more god will take a thing. bad situation and he will make something good come out of it a blessing mm -hmm. he will make something good come out of it whether you realize it in the moment or you realize it at the end of that situation or if you realize it in 10 years looking bad in hindsight hmm. he makes miracles every day amen 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 all right y'all 
Appreciate you guys for listening. Appreciate you guys for sharing, leaving a leaving a review on iTunes. It helps us get this message out to more people. Really appreciate you guys. Have a ton, ton, a ton of value in the pipeline for you guys. We're just making sure we get it out right. We do this right. So appreciate you guys for listening. We will see you again next week. Have a great rest of your week, y'all. That would out.